All right, here we go again. Uh, in this chapter, uh, this is the chapter called Lessons from an American Weapons Designer. We are looking at the work of uh, John Norsine, who was a um, weapons developer, designer, uh, working for Lockheed Martin, specifically in air navigation. Um, basically, there is a way to interact with the pilot's brain in uh, through flight controls and that's what he was working with for Lockheed Martin um, so let's get into this um, uh, Dr. John Norsine was an American weapons designer working on what today would be referred to as neuro weapons He was also a lecturer at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. You'll discover that there are a lot of uh, people working in reflexive control um, who are also working at George Washington University. Um, there seem to be a lot of people in the Department of Defense who work at George Washington University, like James Giordano, who works at GWU. Uh, John Norsine worked at GWU, uh, specialist in reflexive control, um, also work at GWU. When he was employed by Lockheed Martin in the 1990s and early 2000s, the concept of neuroweapon was not widely known outside the deepest of black operation funded military and defense sectors. Even today, the development of such weapons is a highly classified and compartmentalized affair. Luckily, John Norsine was a bit more candid and conversational than most weapons designers working in classified positions for, for defense contractors. Late in his career, for a brief time, he held conversations with uh, artist Duncan Laurie, who worked in the field of radionic art. Uh, Norsine and Laurie's correspondences were published by Laurie on the internet after Norsine died from a heart attack at age 53. Um, it should be noted that, um, according to the documents and other claims by other researchers, you can use neuro weapons, you can use electromagnetic waves to trigger a heart attack. And we'll get into, I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory right now, but we'll get into um, why specifically this might have even been possibility that they actually might have assassinated John Norsine. Um, the first article I could find on the work of John Norsine Uh, dates to a Newsweek article from 2001. He was interviewed for under the title Reading Your Mind and Injecting Smart Thoughts, in which he talks of being able to read terrorist suspects' thoughts remotely. In a subsequent article from 2001 in the Washington Times, NASA plans to read terrorist minds at airports. Norsine notes, Space technology would be adapted to receive and analyze brainwaves and heartbeat patterns then feed that data into computerized programs to detect passengers who potentially might pose a threat. According to briefing documents obtained by the Washington Times, NASA wants to use non-invasive neuroelectric sensors embedded in gates to collect tiny electric signals that all brains and hearts transmit. Computers would, aptly, computers would apply statistical algorithms to correlate physiological patterns with computerized data on travel routines. Criminal background and credit information from hundreds to thousands of data sources, NASA documents say. Um, so it seems pretty obvious that this is not like a big secret, or at least back in the day before it actually became functional, it was actually being talked about. And we'll get to why uh, it got hushed up later. Um, but for now, let's just uh, continue with this. Um, Norsine's innovation in the field of neuroweapons was termed by him Biofusion, first published in academic articles at uh, a conference in 1999. He gives an account to Duncan Laurie below. Biofusion is my name for the next generation of biometric security intelligent interneted security systems. 
Please note that a fundamental basis to biofusion is that brain structures execute biological functions and that such functions can be represented and understood as mathematical equations known as Krylov space, which is, well, well I'll explain that in a second, but Existing in biophysical, time, space, frequency, phase, quantum, state, space. Spoken of here as a Gabor function, a wavelet, a codelet, in Hilbert space. Uh, Hilbert space is a vector space with a complete metric, if you're really into math and uh, physics stuff. But what exactly is biofusion? Biofusion is described as what happens when you think a precise mathematical operation to include when models detect and measure what you think. Um, hyperspectral analysis, he mentions QEEG, uh, which was developed by a Russian scientist named Kropotov. And map where thoughts are in your brain and then via information injection, boom, Monitor, enhance, modify, replace, or prevent neural circuit function, in essence. Enhance, replace, or prevent thoughts. It's an extremely inter multidisciplinary NSF and BIC model, which is specifically due to uh, neuroscientists understand that. But anyway... <laughs> Accordingly, such mathematical representations lend themselves to machine computational interpretation and cross-machine computational communications. Hence, the capability for human-machine interaction and prediction of calculated results. Therefore, if known neurological circuits reading this page or silently saying a sequence of numbers or closing one's eyes and imagining a, a picture let's say the image of the Mona Lisa, then with proper sensing techniques, a display based on the underlying mathematical biophysical space, Krylov space, can be generated which represents the very same neurological function, functioning. There is vast biomedical evidence of this in PET, MEG, EEG, which we talked about earlier with the German inventor, uh, FMRI, etc., which capture various neurological events faithfully and repeatedly. Biofusion extends the singular look of these various medical diagnostic techniques and merges them into a much more robust hyperspectral analysis across the electromagnetic spectrum, within which brain function occurs to correlate and pinpoint with more accurate detail the specific self-similar regions of the brain engaged in mental processing of the target activity. Another known way of capturing electric signals in the brain was proposed by Malik. Uh, this is an American inventor who um, proposed this uh, back in 1974 using standard radar, which draws us back into the Mark G. Trump kind of uh, um, area. This is also the method that a former MI6 agent turned whistleblower Carl Clark noted was used for covert applications of this technology. Here's an outline of how a brain emulation application works. Taking in biometric data and then applying statistical learning algorithms to that data, artificial intelligence, and formulating a profile and brain map of the observed target. In a more technical definition given at a conference in Russia on the topic of reflexive control, Norsin writes, biofusion is, increasingly the biofusion is the increasing complexity of one part of the brain to share mathematically its information with other parts of the brain in a common emergent family of mathematical operations, to which the inverse function, the ability to recreate or trigger stored information by using the inverse mathematics is allowable. Panem's fusion space, heropter operations, dreams, and the distinct linkage of either end of the invariant versus holistic storage continuum of object recognition in the posterior inferior temporal gyri, ITG, as opposed to the more pure prosopopoeia visual perception 
In the fusiform gyrus are very nice examples of biofusion in the visual perception modality. And again, we have to note uh, back in the hypnosis lecture that deeply hypnotized people are more visually oriented. They're, they're more, you know, they're, they're more visual. They're in the fusiform gyrus. Are very nice examples of biofusion and visual perception modality. The ability to blend vision and verbal modalities in the temporal cortex TC-22 and Brodmann's area 44, for example, are fine indications that biofusion is taking place in the more and more complex adaptive regions of the brain. Now, these are very technical uh, details uh, that neuroscientists would understand. Uh, Brodman's area 44, it's interesting, um, this Brodman himself, who he mapped out different areas of the brain, he was working for the Berlin Institute, um, the Berlin Brain Institute under, uh, with Oscar Voigt, and Brodman came up with these things. Um, to continue here, wherever we are. Biofusion is a play on another engineering term, and this is used more in like, um, like um, aircraft uh, sensors or tank sensors, they call this sensor fusion, but usually reserved for purely mechanical sensors such as on ships or aircraft. In essence, what biofusion is, is the discret discretization or quantization of your thoughts into a string represented as a vector, which is a mathematical term, in Krylov subspace. Alexei Krylov was a Russian mathematician that created a special mathematics for various calculations. With the quantization of neural information allows for a computer to process this information and do either deep mining of neural data, such as memories, or insert a new string to be fed into a, a radar or microwave generator, which could also be triggered through gravitational waves because you can... Uh, you can transfer, or I guess transduce, gravitational waves into electromagnetic waves, and vice versa, according to Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden, who did early research this in, for the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency in the 1970s, although it's uh, not discussed much. Uh, with the quantization of neural information allows for a computer to process this information do either deep mining of neural data such as memories or insert a new string to be fed into a radar or microwave generator to generate the necessary, necessary frequencies to alter brain functioning and wiring. What he's talking about here is rewiring your neurons in your brain. I mean, I don't know if anybody else minds the government or some foreign... Um, agency or something outside yourself rewiring your brain but i would prefer to do my own rewiring of my brain naturally but anyway uh Norsin writes anyways i was working with the russian academy of science group in reflexive control and we were developing developing an n-dimensional graph called krylov space after the russian biomathematician krylov and we developed this cursory folding map of how the brain can twist and turn semiotics into biological pressures. Uh, semiotic is um, like a thought. And in certain regions of the map, the person would, as one would expect under harsh and continuing intense pressures, be pushed and molded into some perverse forms of behavior. In other areas of the Krylov map, where things were going good, the map was like a quiet estuary or shallow sea. Very mellow. In a Krylov space, a matrix dimensional grid of one identity, communicating, sharing complex semiotics, thoughts, with another identity, from one person to another person, is what he's saying here. Um... Like I said, a thought is a semiotic. He writes, Well, equally if you are aware that a person is entering an alpha state, and this goes into hypnosis here in brainwaves, um, a better yet, a hypnogogic falling asleep or a hypnopompic state, pre-waking state, of a, of a modified theta-alpha brain engagement region, you can actually see the subconscious mind at work and interact with it. 
You can actually inject semiotics into the mental region and see the brain thoughts surround the semiotic, infuse it, and then act upon it right into the awake states. In this way, you can die inject action potentials for influencing someone during the day. Or you can do the same thing and get alert semiotics injected into the sleeping and even into the life-death interface of the Delta state. Um, just one thing I want to note that I'm, that's not covered in this chapter. It's covered in a later chapter on reflexive control. Um, there is this thing called that um, who we'll hear about later. Uh, his name is Vladimir Lefebvre. Um, he, he came up with the idea of fast reflection. And what, to do, what he's able to do is through the amygdala, which processes your fear um, and anxiety and pain responses, to override your consciousness. And through the amygdala, you, he can directly control you unconsciously. You will do things that you're not even consciously aware of. So, moving down here a little bit. In the defense industry, semiotics has largely been identified with the work of C.S. Pierce. Uh, C.S. Pierce was an American philosopher. He was from a Boston Brahmin family. I don't know if you know much about the Boston Brahmin. Uh, these are the Blue Bloods. These are the Anglo-Saxon old rich families of uh, Boston, of New England, who made most of their money by dealing opium, for instance, to China with their British cousins, or their English cousins specifically, which created uh, the Opium Wars uh, later on. And also people involved in the Opium Wars later on came back to America and tried to overthrow FDR. His wealthy pro-slavery upbringing was later given up for a semi-transcendentalist lifestyle on his farm where he lived in poverty. His effects and influence on the defense industry scientists that use his semiotics and arguments of logic is deep. In the appendix, in the appendix of Norsen and Laurie's communications, there is an explanation of Pearson semiotics that is used by Norsen in his work, along with the scientists we shall read more deeply about, Ed Nozawa, who also worked for Lockheed Martin. Uh, we're not going to cover him in this video, but we will in uh, either the next one or the one after that. Semiotics being the study of signs, the definition according to Pierce, anything representate is anything is a representate representant, which is so determined by anything else, called its object and so determines an effect upon a person, which I call its interpretant. Another important element in Pierce's thought and influence on defense contractor engineering and science is that of the hypothesis. In many of the logic flows of these weapons designers is the concept of forming a hypothesis, then refer referencing a knowledge base, then rerunning whatever iteration of the task is involved in. As we shall read later under Nizawa, the concept of closed-loop systems is a prevalent dynamic in such systems engineered under Piercing logic, creating a truly cybernetic system where all decisions potentially could be automated and based on computer algorithms with no human intervention. And this gets into the issue of automated weapon systems where, again, there is no human uh, intervention. The computers themselves are fighting the wars. And in this case, what he's talking about here is uh, automated um, mind control. More or less, automated mind control. As crazy as that sounds. And one can see how this could go completely wrong from a human perspective, from a common sense perspective, but anyway, this is what they were doing and what they were writing about and what they were engineering. Norsen referred to the process of manipulating the semiotic or signs as thought injection. 
which is given in a section narrated by Duncan Laurie in their correspondence. Theoretically, according to Norseen, each thought represents an energy dispersion pattern which can be monitored by mixed electromagnetic sensors and described mathematically as a brain print. This brain print can be inverted and retransmitted back into the brain like an encoded memory. Subsequently, the brain will act upon this inverse signal as if it were a real signal from the environment. So basically, they're hijacking your environmental sensors and putting whatever information they want you to have uh, in, directly into your brain through thought injection. Um, community programmers, will, will, of course, will take the, the concept of injection. And we all remember the old MySQL injection hacks. And that's what I am always thinking about, how you could... Um, either hack a database or put your own information um, into a database through MySQL injection. And this is the very similar concept. Noisine's point was that if you could trigger that part of the brain remotely via a transmission of some kind, the receiver would be all but powerless over the transmitted responses. A Manchurian candidate with no self-will or control depending on variables such as genes and biochemistry. The implication was clear that a command encrypted as information contained within information, uh, monography is, is an example of this, akin to a hypnotic suggestion, can be buried within unrelated visual and auditory information to be broadcast to the general public. Norseen strongly suggested these techniques were connected to the Columbine murders as though the killers had been infected from encrypted websites beforehand designed intentionally as trial behavior test scenarios. Now, the use of gaming in the gaming community by such agencies as the NSA and GCHQ is well known and documented. Um, we'll get into that later. So it's not totally... Um, ludicrous that they could be doing this or could have been doing this as means of testing their systems on a mass scale. Um, the process of how this works according to Norsen is that he uses biofusion, sensor fusion or data fusion, to collect all the thoughts, semiotes, in one's head then has the ability to either do deep data mining and profiling to either extract or insert more information resulting in either a cracked mind or a rewired mind. Um, in Signal Magazine, which was a military journal, he writes, Now that biofusion research has developed beyond the initial stages in the database of what, how, and where thoughts occur in the brain is mature, scientists are looking at information injection, a contentious issue. Norsen admits the concept is based on the fact that human perception consists of certain invariant electromagnetic and biochemical lock and key interactions with the brain that can be identified, measured, and altered by mathematical operations. If researchers can recreate the inverse function of what has been observed and gain the ability to communicate information back intact or rearranged, to the individual or someone else. Norsen says when you get down to the mathematical properties, information injection is beginning to be demonstrated. The brain is very susceptible to accepting information that is either real and comes from its own memory mechanisms or from injection from an outside source. By using information injection, a person could be isolated from a group and made to believe that something is happening, while others in the group are being left alone. Likewise, someone at a command post monitoring information on the screen could be affected. Some experts believe that adversaries now are designing techniques that could affect the brain and alter the human body's ability to process stimuli. As can be seen, this technology has a very brazen double edge. Of course, it could be used to monitor a criminal to prevent them from committing crime, probably in the context of previous conviction under the law, but it could also be used by criminals of another sort to easily manipulate and control innocent persons, thus being an even greater threat to security than it could potentially prevent. 
What we are talking about here is the modification and alteration of behaviors. The modification of behavior is understood by Norsen as reflexive control, which was pioneered by not just Soviet scientists and Nazi scientists, but also has its fair representation in American psychological scientific literature. For instance, several members of the editorial board of a publication dedicated to reflexive control in Russia come from the United States and Canada. Moving down here a little bit. Uh, to define reflexive control, uh, reflexive control is defined as a means of conveying to a partner or an opponent specially prepared information to climb him, her, they to voluntarily make the predetermined decision desired by the initiator of the action. It is an interesting point that the usual understanding of a reflexive control is usually a voluntary made, but with thought injection, we are talking about a reflexive control that is involuntary, even unconscious. Defense Research Union give the following technical of reflexive control. According to Russian methodologies, the theory of reflexive control allows an initiator to induce an adversary to take a decision advantageous to the initiator through information manipulation. The reflexive control theory encompasses a methodology where specifically prepared information is conveyed to an adversary which would lead that adversary to make a decision desired by the initiator. The methodology is generally understood by Russian planners to be applicable in a wide variety of situations and is deeply rooted within Russian information warfare concepts. Because theory envelopes the Russian understanding of information as both technical data and cognitive content, information resources are understood as technological as well as human. In principle, a well-developed global cyberspace, present, cyberspace presents theorists and operators of reflexive control and reflexive control methodology with numerous possibilities to affect their adversaries. This paper explores ways in which reflexive control can be exercised with the help of the cyberspace. Um, although I'm talking about reflexive control here, um, there's an entire chapter which goes really deep into this subject and looks at all kinds of different research and how it's done and how they use reflexive control to break up groups. Um, uh, another, an, in a later um, video, I will be going over how to how to uh, destroy an anarchist collective. Uh, in one of those examples, there is a frequency that they can put out uh, at 6.6 .6 hertz, which um, can cause males to be very, very aggressive, including sexually aggressive. And one of the things I've run into in anarchist collectives, even though all anarchists are, are against, um, are for consent. <laughs> they are for consent. But again and again, you run into the situation where you're seeing many anarchist groups being split apart by sexual assault. So we have to be aware of these things. And I'm going to go into, a, uh, this is going to be an entire video on how to break up an anarchist collective using this technology. Uh, Norsen worked directly with one prominent Russian specialist and leader of reflexive control, Andrei V. Bruchlinsky, who, according to Laurie Mick, Remarking on Norsen's perceptions of Dr. Bruzlinski, I was to discover a central figure in the field of reflexive control was the Russian scientist and distinguished member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Andrei V. Bruzlinski. Norsen had visited him not so very long before we met. Subsequently, Bruzlinski was found robbed and murdered. Norsen believes he was killed by foreign agents seeking the scientific protocols he had developed for a type of weaponized thought insertion called steganography, or stego bullets for short. Of course, one can see the direct application of thought injection, whether based on the methods of Norsen or Bruce Linsky, in a weaponized space, especially in warfare. So it is not surprising that there would come some espionage intrigue along with this research area. So it is important to understand what precisely is happening in reflexive control that it would be such a high-value target in, in, in international espionage.
So, traversing from reflexive control engineered through thought injection, we come to larger issues that affect groups, collectives, and societies as a whole. As the Russian meddling in the U.S. 2016 election clamor has brought to the attention such concepts of information operations by hostile forces to the attention of the average citizen, it should be mentioned again that in 2011, British GCHQ sponsored studies on undermining social network perceptions on a mass scale. Yet there is not much meaningful discussion of these terms. Information operations and warfare, also known as influence operations, include the collection of tactical information about an adversary, as well as the dissemination of propaganda in pursuit of a competitive advantage over an opponent. Information operations are used in direct correlation to the methods of perception management. And to define perception management, Perception management involves all actions that convey and or deny selected information and indicators to foreign audiences to influence their emotions, motives, and objective reasoning, and to intelligence systems and leaders to all levels to influence official estimates, ultimately resulting in foreign behaviors and official actions favorable to the originator's objectives. In various ways, perception management combines truth projection, operation security, cover, and deception, and psychological operations. The key word in understanding perception management, whether for selling beer or conducting PSYOP, is expectation. Tons of advertising research dollars swirls down the drain getting commercials right and the audience wrong. You have to either match up the right situation or control the expectation level of the target audience. This holds true for either media or PSYOP management. But imagine if you could actually monitor expectations non-invasively, quietly, garnering sufficient measurement of how designed information is interacting with the central nervous system of the intended audience. This is what the science of semiotics, signs and symbols, is heading towards and can be seen today in forms such as engagement indices and other biometric audience attention. This would appear to be the logical extension of neurocontrol into marketing and perception management. Uh, this is um, one thing that's uh, very um, we should be aware of in terms of um, the military neuro weapons are known as neuro warfare but in the commercial space in the business world this is actually practice there is there are no laws against this actually uh, and in the business world they call this neuro marketing they don't call it neuro weapons they call it neuro marketing um, in an interview with Ryan Moore uh, he asked, so what are the potential military applications of information injection? Uh, Norsey replies, if information injection pans out, the concept that human perception is made up of certain invariant electromagnetic and biochemical lock and key interactions, which he called QSK, with brain structure which can be identified, measured, and altered by mathematical technical operations, then the stage is set to observe, capture, rearrange, and play back human mental functions from one person to another or into any combination of man-machine system interface. Norsen goes even further with the technique suggesting its automation and usage by computer systems in an academic paper. The concept of injection of information for information operations from one human into another human or for, from a machine generation of information to a human, the inverse function is utmost and vital. In order to trigger or refine or replace or sharpen an old perception in the human or to create brand new perceptions, the exact inverse function must be known or very close to it in order to fool the brain into accepting it as real. And this inverse injection must also very closely model the exact E and H fields, this is the electromagnetic fields of uh, Maxwell's equations. I know that's pretty geeky and technical, but the electromagnetic field shapes that the original Gabor-like function in Hilbert space occupied. 
skip this down here. Um, as one reads scientific publications on reflexive control and semiotics, a name that is often encountered is that of D.A. Lefebvre and D.A. Pospolev. Lefebvre, now teaching in the United States, has created an interesting paradigm known as reflexive game theory. Uh, another Lockheed Martin uh, researcher we will be reading about in, uh, in either the next or uh, in one of the two next sections is named Singlob. Um, he and another he goes into reflexive game theory and developing weapons systems. Um, but there is another researcher, another Russian researcher named Tereshenko who works for, in, in Japan, he works for one of the largest um, uh, private equity firms, a financial firm, using reflexive game theory. I mean, one can imagine why a financial firm would be interested in this. I mean, it doesn't take much to see why they would be interested in this. According to Cherishenko, the reflexive game theory has been entirely developed by Lefebvre and is based on the principle of anti-selfishness or egoism forbiddenness in human reflection processes. Therefore, RGT is based on the human-like decision-making processes. The main goal of the theory is to model behaviors of individuals in the groups. It is possible to, pre to predict choices which are likely to be made by each individual in the group and influence each individual's decision, making do to make this individual to make a certain choice. In Reflexive game theory can be used to predict behavior. In general, the reflexive game theory is a simple tool to predict behaviors of individuals and influence individuals' choices. Therefore, it makes possible to control the individuals in the groups by guiding their behavior, decision-making choices by means of the corresponding influences. It is important to point out that anti-terrorism aspect is a particular application of reflex game theory, while as Lefebvre writes, in general, it can be used for mass applications. Like I said before, um, when they're, they're getting funding from the government to develop these things, they're not saying we want to control everybody. They're saying we want to prevent terrorism or insurgents or anarchists would be considered an insurgent. I remember the IWW would be considered an insurgent, etc. You get my point here. Um, where was I? But uh, Tereshenko goes one step further, and they imagine uh, Tereshenko wants to use robots to influence people. And he writes about this. Tereshenko notes regarding the influence of robots on humans in 2010. However, robots are forbidden and should not physically force people, but most convince people on the mental level to refrain from doing a risky action. This method is more effective rather than a simple physical compulsion because humans make the decisions, choices themselves, and treat these decisions as their own. Such technique is called a reflexive control. Now, you can, uh, it's very important to understand this. What he's saying here is you're, you're, taking, you're getting thought injected but you yourself can't differentiate that you are being targeted and having thoughts put into your head. You think they're your thoughts. And they might even be thoughts that you hear in your own voice and usually are. So it's very, it's a very sinister process that they have going on here. Um, this was actually used in the first Gulf War to get Iraqi troops to surrender because they thought they heard Allah telling them to surrender to the Americans. The task of finding appropriate reflexive control is closely related with the inverse task. When we need to find <clears throat> when we need to find suitable influence of one subject on another one or on a group of subject on the subject of interest, therefore it is needed to develop the framework of how to solve the inverse task. In this sense, using uh, reflexive game theory crosses boundaries between st strictly human to human interactions and goes into robot-to-human or AI-to-human interactions to generate desired behaviors using an AI agent. With the collapse of the former adversary of the Soviet Union, many Russian scientists that had previously been employed by the KGB and, and GRU uh, found themselves in need of funding and sponsorship. Quickly stepping into the sponsorship vacuum came the American secret intelligence agencies 
seeking to acquire Soviet technology. Norsin, it is known, worked with Russian scientists in the reflexive control area of expertise. Notable among these is the previously mentioned murdered scientist Bruce Linsky, an A, uh, AI pioneer Dr. Prospolev, and AI designer VK Finn, and founder of the reflexive game theory of Lefavre. Uh, it's very important to understand that the entire, all these systems that were brought to America, the, all the American systems for thought injection, reflexive control, were designed by these Russians. They were not designed by Americans. They were bought by the Americans, brought, and some of their scientists were brought to America to work with the NSA, but we'll find out here. Some more about that. The collaboration between Russian and American defense engineers and scientists can be traced, at least publicly, to 1995, when Russian groups sought out foreign funding sources. One of them calling itself a Semiotic Design and Control Group of Russian Academy of Sciences has recently communicated an interest in working with researchers in the United States. In response to this interest, U.S. government has sponsored and many other government agencies were involved in two workshops, one in Columbus, Ohio in June 1995, the other in Monterey, California in August 1995. Norsin's use of semiotics, reflexive control, and thought injection is not new with him. In the research corridor of New Mexico, largely associated with U.S. government scientific research, for instance, Sandia Labs, who is owned by Lockheed Martin, run by Lockheed Martin, but is a government lab, is located there. There was a team created at the Physical Science Laboratory at the University of New Mexico State University, this team was founded by Russian emigre Vladimir Lefebvre, who is cited by Norsin in his research. And uh, right here we can see that uh, we have uh, Lefebvre is in the middle here and some American scientists and other people from New Mexico State University's Physical Science Laboratory. So anyway. Um, Norsin talks about the early development of, of semiotics and reflexive control uh, with uh, Lori. Of, of Pearson scientific semiotics and its role in the United States national security, I can honestly say that I was part of the inception in the early 1990s and have watched over the last first national security working group of semiotics to where it is now a recognized science effort around the world. But with not nearly enough book elucida elucidation and still lacking a dedicated national scientific philosophy linkage into national security, almost all the pacing Soviet scholars that I have met are now dead or corrupted, and most of the working semiotics is now under a classified rubric. At least I can edify about the frolicsome years from 1995 to 2002 where no holds barred and semiotics as a new occult held sway. Uh, he goes further into the frolicsome years. The frolicsome years that Norsin talks about are reflected in a meeting with Russian researchers. Norsin... <laughs> Sorry. Norsin was talking to Lori about this. But to quote Norsin... Uh, uh, actually, Lori is recounting what Norsin told him. The next time he found himself at the Double Eagle, a bar in New Mexico, it was with a group of Russian semioticians with whom he was collaborating. This eclectic group was formed in the early 1960s by a Soviet general that set up a secret program of covert reflexive control operations with the KGB and GRU, now under the direction of a certain Dr. Pospolev, of extreme interest to Lieutenant General Ken Minahan, the director of the National Security Agency. Norsin was tired when they arrived, and as he walked in, the lights of the saloon went crazy. The one person capable of working the entire bar, physical and non-physical, had arrived. As Norsin worked his way into trance once again, the entities allowed him to enter the minds of his Russian colleagues. Probing their thoughts and memories, to their horrified surprise, he began casually rattling off the contents of their mind. At the conclusion of the story, Norsin was careful to point out that every one of these Russians, save the general with the gold tooth, is now dead or incapacitated. Though it is noble, notable that he may have been employing this technology to debrief the Russian scientists in an environment of high suggestibility using alcohol as a trans agent, we'll get into this later, uh, 
the role of alcohol. There's a specific thing about alcohol that Norsine talks about, and that's called THIQ. The important point in this recollection is the role of the NSA in sponsoring these Russian scientists in collaboration with American weapons designers working for Lockheed Martin. Uh, the question of Bruzlinski's murder is an interesting one. Bruzlinski's research specifically contributed to activity theory, which is important to the field of human computer interface. You could also see Victor Finn's quasi axiomatic theory. <laughs> While the public reasoning behind his homicide was simple burglary, it is very provocative that the U.S. was working on the very technology he was working on, but for the Russian Federation. Adding to the intrigue is the statement of a leading researcher in Russia regarding the murder and theft. In the meantime, the director of the Institute for the Psychological Precautions Against Terrorism, Professor Victor First, released a sensational statement. He said that Bruchlinski did not follow the victim of the street robbers. The briefcase contained exclusive documents about the newest reflexive method of searching for terrorists. The concept was developed at one of the labs of the mentioned institute, and Professor Lepsky was in charge of that work. Dr. First goes on further to note that the findings of this research were presented to a joint NATO-Russia conference. So, undoubtedly, NATO states would have been aware of this, and they've been looking for, you know, this coming down the pipelines. Norseen in his conversations with Laurie notes a sea change in the development of these ideas in research as the technology became tangible and in production, in use. Norseen rather unwisely used his work email address to communicate with Laurie regarding this subject. It is not known if an internal security audit picked up on his conversations or not, but around 2002, during his active conversations with civilians on this subject, he writes of his security clearance and assignment changing. Norsing says, I just found out that my clearances have been updated. I go in for a new top secret indoctrination tomorrow. Also at work, my computer and my phone and my office were taken down. I enter over the next few weeks a new office, a new program, and new computer phone identities. It's very odd. It was not long after this that Lori has recollected that Norsing's security clearances were revoked and he was removed from classified projects. Then not too long after that, died of a heart attack at the age of 53. So, it's interesting. I mean, people working on this are dying. They're being killed. Um, did Norsing have uh, a heart attack due to natural causes or did they use biological effects from neuroweapons, which they can do? to uh, uh, kill him off. Like, it seems that the same thing happened to Brzezinski, although that was to seal his technology. And maybe here, Norsing spoke too much, and this is to get everybody else to shut up. All right, so I'm going to end this section right here, and we'll continue on with uh, semiotics and quantum consciousness next. <laughs>